Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Dean's Speaker Series here, uh, co-sponsored today by the Deans of the College of Communications, uh, the College of Fine Arts, and the School of Management. We're really pleased to have you with us, and collectively we join and, and welcome everybody. And this afternoon we're very honored to have a broadcasting icon, Dennis Swanson, with us. Uh, to join us as our guest, uh, you can read, uh, I saw a number of you doing so, uh, uh, Dennis's bio in the program you've received, and, and Dennis uh, has an incredible more than 50-year career in broadcast journalism uh, and has incredible stories to tell, as I learned earlier this afternoon and we'll share together in a conversation this afternoon. Uh, what we thought we'd do from a format standpoint is that uh, Dennis and I'll have a conversation for the first several minutes and then perhaps uh, no more than roughly 30 minutes into the game, uh, it's all up to you. Uh, that we'll have time for any questions you might have about anything at all. There'll be microphones provided so everybody here can hear your questions. Uh, and uh, I believe you're in for a wonderful treat uh, this afternoon. Uh, Dennis, as you see in the program, is president of, of television, uh, television station operations for Fox Television. Uh, in this capacity, he manages 27 uh, Fox-owned and operated stations all around the United States. Uh, and he has touched all of the major broadcast networks in his career, but I don't want to touch all of that yet until we begin this conversation. So why don't we begin, Dennis? And, and Dennis, uh, uh, maybe we could start with the early days. Uh, a number of students with us today, of course, our primary audience. Uh, when did you decide that a career in broadcasting was going to be what you'd do? Um, we got a television in my house uh, when I was like a, maybe a sophomore or junior in high school. And um, I was fascinated by it. I thought, wow, this is the greatest thing that's uh, ever been invented. <laughs> and I, I want to be a part of it. And um, so um, I was on my way to being in television, except for one problem. Um, I had to go to college, and we didn't have very much resources to get me there. So um, I, I actually got into a competition and I won an engineering scholarship. Um, and uh, the university, I grew, I was in Springfield, the University of Illinois is about 70 miles east of there. So I could hitchhike over there, which I did, uh, with my engineering scholarship. Now, Illinois is an engineering school. I mean, that's primarily what it's noted for. So um, I was like your president, Dr. Brown. I was in chemical engineering for two and a half years. And while he went on and got a doctorate, I hated it, and I just, honest to God, hated it. I couldn't take it anymore. I went to, org I think it was organic chemistry that drove me out. I kept breathing those fumes, and I said, man, I'm going to die if I keep doing this. <laughs> You're so, among friends in most of this audience, I would and say. So, yes. um, so I, 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 I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell the scholarship people. I just, I called the College of Communications and, uh, and transferred. And um, when, um, for my second semester of my junior year. And then I called the scholarship people and told them that they could save their money. Um, I, I transferred to communications. And, uh, and they said, well, Dennis, your grades are OK. And we know you need the money. So um, we'll keep sending you the money, which was great. So uh, I kept my scholarship, but went, w but went to the College of Communications to get a degree. My uh, uh, BS is in journalism, and my MS is in communications with a minor in political science. And where did you get your first start? Um, well, my first start was on the campus radio station doing a, sp a sports scoreboard show. And then I moved to the university radio and television station and did a little bit of everything in front of and behind the camera. And then my first commercial job uh, was in uh, a radio television station in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Everybody listen up. You know, those small markets really is a very important, still a very important. Well, market. it's where I really learned uh, to apply the, th the things that I'd learned uh, at the university. And, um, and I had a hard time getting a job. Uh, in, in those days, um, it was early in our business, and uh, they, th they wanted people that had commercial experience, and I didn't have any. Um, you know, I'd, you know, I had two degrees, and I'd uh, been in, I'd served in the Marine Corps as an officer, but um, uh, they, they didn't care. And I'd done stuff for the university; they didn't care. I wanted to know what my commercial experience was, and it took me a while. Actually, my professor at Illinois finally got me the job because he'd worked at that station, and so I went out there. For, I was there for, what 16 months, and then 
got a job in Chicago and worked in Chicago and Los Angeles and New York ever since. And now when you were in Los Angeles, uh, you were a station manager there for KABC television, you spent much of your career at ABC. Uh, you won a Peabody Award in 1978. Uh, uh, tell us a bit about uh, how that came about. Yeah, well, it, it started um, when I went to Los Angeles. Uh, I went to L.A. to KABC in uh, uh, January of 76 uh, as executive producer. Ultimately, I became assistant news director and then in 77 became news director. We started the coverage of the Los Angeles Police Department in 76 when I was the exec producer. We had a city wire. And I, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, the perspective. You know, it was a different set of eyes. It was not, it wasn't somebody that had been there that was always ripping the wire. I mean, it was new eyes now. And one of the things that stuck out to me after about three or four months was the number of unarmed civilians, um, uh, citizens, that had been uh, shot and killed in confrontations with the Los Angeles Police Department. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, we had a reporter there, Wayne Satz, very uh, bright reporter. He was an attorney. And um, I said, Wayne, I said, uh, let's get into this. I want to find out why so many uh, unarmed citizens, and it looks like most of them are minorities, um, are shot and killed by the LAPD. And we went on a whirlwind adventure that took us over three years, 76, 77, 78. And it wound up um, uh, with a grand jury investigation. And uh, we presented all our um, stories and information and everything to the grand jury. And the result of the grand jury was to change the shooting policy of the Los Angeles Police Department. And whereas they'd been, uh, you know, 28, 29, 30 deaths a year under the old policy when the new policy was put into effect, in which there was accountability. There had to be, so when, there was an, when there was an unarmed citizen shot and killed in the future, you had to have somebody from the coroner's office there, you had to have somebody from the district attorney's office there and, and, and get all the facts as to, as to what went on. And once that accountability process, uh, in the subsequent years, uh, the, the, the number of citizens uh, uh, shot and killed was about half the total, 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, that was the good that came from the story. Um, unbeknownst to either Wayne or myself, the form of the grand jury bundled up all our stuff and sent it to uh, Athens, Georgia, to the Peabody Committee and said, these two guys are pretty brave. They should get some sort of an award. <laughs> and so they, they did give us an award. Now, soon after your time at KABC-TV, you moved to Chicago and you were at WLS and you discovered somebody that we may all know as Oprah. How did this happen? I mean, you were the person who really introduced her to broadcast television. Well, um, I, I, I got to Chicago, and uh, the station was a mess. We were in last, and they had sent me there to fix it. And so um, I, you could have almost started anywhere, but um, I, I'd been in the station on a Monday morning for 20 minutes when the morning show guy came in. It says, you got to do me a favor. I got a chance to go to New York. You know, can you let me out of my contract? And I said, well, uh, let's talk about it after the show. So um, he came back to my office. In the meantime, I'd gone down to research and found out that we were last uh, <laughs> in the morning show. And, uh, and Phil Donahue was uh, doing his show in New York across the street and was uh, very successful and number one in the time period. We couldn't get arrested. So... When the kid came back, I said, look, I said, I'm in a good mood. It's your lucky day. I'm going to let you out of a contract, but don't tell anybody I did that. Uh, <laughs> and so then we went on a search. And I said to the search group, uh, you know, the program director and the station manager, I said, look, I said, instead of trying to out Donahue, Donahue, why don't we look at women and see if we can find an alternative for the viewers? And so that afternoon, a, a young lady in our program department who just started a week before me came down. She said, I understand you're interested in women to do the morning show. She said, uh, I have a tape here. It's not very good, but this is an extremely capable talent. Her name is Oprah Winfrey. She's in Baltimore, where I came from. And she might be somebody you should consider. So, you know, we went on and compiled a list of people, but I was intrigued by the Oprah Winfrey story. So. We brought her in to do an audition on Labor Day weekend of 1983, and it was, uh, 
I, I told the program department, I want to do a full one hour AM Chicago show, make it a difficult show, um, and let's see what this uh, woman can do. And um, I'm sitting there watching this taping in my office, and I thought, oh my goodness, um, Dennis, you just solved the, the, the morning show problem. Uh, this woman is the best you've ever seen. And uh, she came down afterwards because it was uh, Labor Day weekend, it was a holiday. People couldn't get out of the station fast enough. They cussed me out for having to do an audition on Saturday, going out the door. Um, but, you know, that was all right. Uh, you know, we had a winner. It was. Um, <laughs> and then Oprah and I sat there for a couple hours and, and became friends. And uh, she desperately wanted to do the show, and she made that clear. And, uh, but she wanted to do it alone. She didn't want to co anchor. And I told her that uh, we weren't making budget, so if I could get by with hiring one person rather than two, <laughs> that was fine with me. Um, <clears throat> and she said, uh, you know, I'm black. And I said, yeah, I kind of figured that out. <laughs> and she says, I'm overweight. And I said, so am I. It's okay. Uh, but I said, look, I said, uh, I don't want you to change a thing. I said, I don't want a new hairdo. I don't want you to lose weight. I don't want anything different than what I just saw. I said, um, you're perfect. I said, you, the overweight thing will help you because it'll create a vulnerability. And for you to get accepted in some, uh, some audiences, uh, a little vulnerability won't hurt you. And I said, uh, but now that I think about it, I do have a concern. I said, uh, uh, my concern would be, do you have the ability to cope with success? I said, because I've seen people push their success right up their nose. And she said, um, do you really think I'd be that successful? I said, you know, this is going to cost me money, but lady, you are going to shoot the lights out. <laughs> and and uh, then the trick, though, was um, to get her to Chicago because she still had uh, a contract that ran till the end of the year, and then they had a 60-day option. And so it's only Labor Day, so I got to go through four months at the earliest to get her on the air, and then maybe through, um, through the Feb book. I, I wanted to get started January 1. And so I told her attorney, fortunately he was a powerhouse, Ron Shapiro was her attorney, and he represented a lot of the Baltimore Orioles at the time, Brooks Robinson. That's when Baltimore could beat the Red Sox, okay? Um, and so... Um, it's a he, long time ago. Yes. Um, <laughs> But he got her out of uh, her contract, and she started work uh, at uh, WLS on, on uh, January 1, 1984, and we went from last to first in one month, which is almost unheard of. And you gave her the break that and really launched her career. Yeah, you know, and it was unbelievable. I walked over to City Hall with her just a couple of weeks after she'd been on the air. I mean, people who had scraps of paper wanted her autograph, dollar bills wanted her autograph. It, it, it was really something, Amazing. and you know, God bless her. She's uh, she did a great job, and then uh, um, I sent her tape back to the network, and they passed. It's the best thing that ever happened to her. Um, <laughs> no, really, because you know, the, you know, how could a local show you know have any network appeal? So we had to, so I, I we had to let her syndicate, and uh, which she owned the show. She made all the money. You know, she. She wouldn't be a billionaire today if, she, if the network <laughs> accepted her show, so it, it all worked out good what for her. What an amazing story. Now, now, let's talk sports for a little bit. Uh, one of the more popular topics of conversation among undergraduates in various schools is getting into some form of either sports management, sports communications, uh, you name it, this whole notion. I wanted to be an organist and pianist when I grew up, so for me, playing the organ at Shea Stadium at one point was my <laughs> career aspiration. And So you, you ran uh, ABC Sports as the president for roughly 10 years at a time of tremendous transformation at ABC. And, and uh, as you were there, there were a couple of things that happened under your watch that you led that are truly transformational. Uh, perhaps you could start with the International Olympics Committee and your interaction with them as you transformed Olympic broadcasting. Well, I got there in 86, and we had the rights to Calgary in 88. And Calgary was going to be difficult because um, the United States had a terrible Winter Olympics team. And they performed in Calgary terrible. I think we won like six medals. And in fact, it was George Steinbrenner who said that will never happen to us again and, and, and put together the, uh, the process that in the last two Olympics, the United States has won more medals than anybody. But um, at the time, I knew we had a bad hockey team. 
and, um, and we needed hockey five nights in prime. Um, and so if, if they, we played the Czechs and the Russians the first two games, we were going to be 0-2 and, and no interest. <laughs> but if we played Norway and Austria in the first two games, we'd be 2-0 and, and lots of interest. So I needed to get that changed, and we needed an interval in the ski and so on. So I set up an appointment with Juan Antonio Samaranch, who was the head of the IOC, to introduce myself and to make a plea, because we were paying, uh, we were way at overpaid for these Olympics, and we were going to lose money. And so um, and it wasn't a deal I made, but um, <laughs> I inherited it. And so um, I, I, I needed some help. And so I, I went into uh, Lausanne, Switzerland in the summer when I was on the way the British Open. And um, for which we had the contract. And um, our Paris office, uh, the, the gentleman there had got, gotten me the appointment. Uh, we had an office in Paris. So we go in, and it was like a four o'clock appointment till five. And it's about a quarter to five. And I've made my plea for the hockey and the skiing and all the stuff. And so we're just sort of shooting the breeze. And I suggested that um, if they wanted to maximize the Olympics rather than have them two in one year, why not spread them out and have one every two years? I said the networks will be able to pay more because they won't have two gorillas in one year. They'll have them spaced out. And I said the advertisers have got to love it because it gives them a marketing strategy you know, every two years as opposed to once every four years. And so he took it under consideration. We got outside in the car, and the fellow from Paris that was running the bureau there just berated me up one side and down the other that I had insulted the IOC and I told him he was just being overly French and um, <laughs> I said I, I, I said I don't think he took it as an insult and so you know now I'm sitting in my office back in New York a couple months later six six weeks later the phone rings and my assistant comes in and says it's Juan Antonio Samaranch comes on the phone he says Swanson it is done I think he means the hockey schedule I said well that's great he's no 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 he says we've moved the Olympics he said, he says, are you surprised? I said, uh, well, I've told you you're very powerful, so I guess you can get the votes when you want to. And I said, but what about the hockey schedule? <laughs> <laughs> um, ultimately, we got the hockey schedule, um, and he was very helpful with that. And, and just as uh, we thought, the United States beat Austria, beat Norway. We built a lot of momentum. We got beat by the Russians and the Czechs. And, uh, but we milked the ratings all the way through, and, and, and so, so, so it worked out okay. Now, you also rebuilt the ABC Monday Night Football franchise uh, to reestablish tremendous ratings leadership. How did you go about that exercise? Here's a, a great American icon called America, you know, ABC Monday Night Football, Howard Cosell and others in the early days. Uh, and then you come in and you take it to the next level. How did that come about? Well, uh, I didn't inherit uh, Don Meredith and Howard Andy Cosell. And Howard. They were long gone. They right? were great, and that was a great combination. I inherited O.J. Simpson and Joe Namath. Uh, <laughs> you know, somebody said, you want to know how tough Dennis is? He fired O.J. Simpson. Um, I said, no, I sent somebody to do that. I did Namath. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I said, uh, uh, we, we, we got to make some changes. And so uh, Al Michaels, you know, worked in the division, and so they were going to have him do college football, and we had Keith Jackson, so I said, hey, we're going to make Al the play-by-play -play guy on Monday night. We'll put Keith and make him the play-by-play -play guy on college, and then, uh, then we, and we'll make Frank one of the color guys, and we hired Dan Deardorff and made the other color guy. We changed the director. We changed the producer. Craig Janoff was the one that got all those great shots, and, um, and the producer we made, Kenny Wolf, uh, he, he was played basketball over here at Harvard when he was an undergrad, um, but he, he really knew the, the, his sports. And, and then uh, we got a theme song. Um, promotion came uh, forward with uh, three songs. I, I hated the first one. Uh, it was uh, Hank Williams, uh, Jr., All My Rowdy Friends, and we converted that in uh, Monday Night Party. And uh, I, d I never listened to the third song. I, d I just didn't want to confuse myself. I'd like the second one. And that whole comment, we worked with the league to get a better schedule. Mm -hmm. And uh, the combination of everything, uh, uh, it, it put Monday Night Football back in the top five all-network programs for, uh, I think, the last six years. It was, it was great. Tremendous. And, and, and ABC, of course, was a, an investor early and, and still owns a, a chunk of ESPN. How did they factor into your 
uh, life at ABC Sports. It seems like, wasn't ESPN formed roughly in that same era? Well, it, it, um, Leonard Goldenson actually had the foresight to buy ESPN back in the early 80s. And, you know, there, there were people who criticized him, quite honestly, for that purchase, but it turned out to be, I mean, that's the, it's a huge uh, value. Um, and, you know, we tried to help them, uh, like, you know, they did a lot of the America's Cup, and that was a contract that we at ABC Sports had, had gotten, and we, we, we turned it, you know, we turned that over to them. Um, and, you know, we worked together, uh, you know, we negotiated uh, 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 football together when they finally got into the football business. Uh, uh, but um, uh, it's, it's really why Disney bought ABC. And, and, but Disney didn't want ABC Sports, so, um, you know, I was working on the, uh, on the BCS thing uh, then, and we'd gotten the, the Rose Bowl uh, uh, convinced to come in and join the Sugar uh, Fiesta and, and uh, Orange Bowl and create the BCS, but um, the, then that purchase by, of ABC by Disney came along, and that's why uh, they, they merged, and uh, so... Um, and they, they wanted ESPN, so I, I, that's when I went to NBC. And you worked alongside Rune Arledge, who at the time, I guess, had moved from sports to Yeah, the news. Cap Cities guys did not want Arledge to do both news and sports. Uh, they wanted him to do the news. And I was doing the stations at the time, and they're a stations company. They wanted their own people doing the stations, so they put me in charge of sports. And uh, Rune and I worked together on the Calgary Olympics. Uh, I was responsible for, you know, the budgeting and the administration and uh, everything, but he was the executive producer in the control room. And it was fun to work with him, and uh, uh, he did a great job. We got great numbers, and uh, in, in uh, particularly our primetime number, and it, it, was, uh, it was a good project. Now, in, Chicago, in New York, you made the switch then from ABC to the enemy, in yes, a way, to NBC, yep. And, yep. and you took WNBC TV, the, the flagship station for NBC, from a, a number two to the clear number one in the New York market after years and years and years of ABC television, WABC dominating. What was the secret sauce? What was the secret to your success? In well, that? I think two things. Um, one is, um, it was our news, and um, we really worked to uh, put on a better news product. We had pretty good talent. We had Chuck Scarborough and Sue Simmons, but we really needed to improve our content, and, and we did that. Um, and you know, we lost Matt Lauer and Al Roker to the Today Show, so we had to replace them. But you know, we had Janice Huff to do the weather, and we had uh, Len Berman to do the sports. So I mean, we had a good uh, we, we had a good cast, and even though we lost these two uh, real good talent to to the network, and um, and then the other thing that we did is we we brought in a lot of New York kinds of programming. We you know we did. Uh, the uh, 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 the opening of the Broadway season, we did a special uh, in September. We got the marathon, New York City marathon, in November. We did we made the Christmas tree lighting into a, a special, which uh, ultimately the network picked up in, in December. We got the Puerto Rican Day Parade, the uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and the Columbus Day Parade. All big parades down Fifth Avenue. Uh, you know the the cardinal comes out and greets them, and so. Um, it was, uh, the, those were great community events, and then we extended our outreach into the ethnic communities, and that combination of, of uh, real good news, uh, New York City events, and the um, outreach to the community uh, groups, uh, that combination uh, uh, got us into first place. We, we knocked ABC out of there for the first time in 16 years. It was something that was a we, in those days, we had the budget to do a party, so we did one. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've now you've worked at all the major networks, uh, yes. CBS, NBC, ABC, and, and now Fox. How would you contrast the, the cultures of these organizations? Are they largely the same, being no. part of the same no, industry? No, they're different. Or how do they differ? Um, ABC is a station company. Um, uh, it was when Leonard Goldenson created it. The station division was profitable and, and kept uh, the payroll uh, going, and, uh, and it was really a station. It was the, the network came along later, but it was the stations that were the driving force of that. And then when Cap Cities bought it, they were a station company, and the stations really <laughs> ruled the roost. Um, and so um, that 
uh, would be how I would categorize ABC. NBC and CBS are network companies. They were the first two networks formed, um, and they were uh, really, um, they thought network first and, se and station second. And the stations had little impact or little input uh, you know, for them. Um, I think as time went on and they saw the success that ABC had with their stations and the profitability encouraged them, which was good for me because that's why I got hired. You know, you know the, the NBC people said, Dennis, just do for us here what you did for them over there. And so uh, that, that, that worked out good for me. And then uh, Fox, I would say, is sort of a combination of both. You know, the, uh, you know most network stations get two-thirds of their programming from the network. At Fox, we get two hours a day, um, you know, in prime time, that's it. So. Um, I, I would categorize, uh, you know, and our station division is very uh, profitable, very successful, um, and is one of uh, Mr. Murdoch's cash cows. Not as lucrative as it has been, but in these thin times, but it's still, uh, you know, is a, re a revenue producer for him. And, um, and, and so, but he created the fourth network out of thin air. Nothing. So, yeah. you know, with the purchase of the NFL as the driving force, you know, if, other people had watched what he'd done. He did it with uh, rugby in, in Australia, and he did it with soccer in England. You know, that was his pattern. And you could see what he was going to do with football, and he, and he, and he built a distribution system yeah. off the back and of does it. And does he, uh, you know, there's been a lot of press about Rupert for many reasons recently, for other elements of his media empire. Uh, is, is, is he a, a hands-on, uh, keeping a close eye kind of guy, or is, given the size of his enterprise, is it pretty much decentralized and you... Uh, have a lot of flexibility. Well, I, I think it's a combination of both. I think he um, he allows his managers to manage, um, but he he wants to know what's going on. So, um, you know, we, we we have a good relationship with him in our in our division. But um, you know, the day in and day out stuff. I mean, when, with with twenty seven television stations, um, you know, we have to hire competent people in those locations. And, and, and basically let them run their operation. You can't micromanage 27 yeah. you know, facilities. Now, how about GE? I mean, not necessarily thinking that Jack Welch would be necessarily micromanaging oriented, but he was very focused on the details. Uh, I understand you're a green belt uh, in Six Sigma lingo. <laughs> yes. uh, I mean, one of the very few broadcasting icons, I believe, that are Six Sigma qualified. I mean, how, how, did the, how was the existence under Jack uh, Welch over it? Oh, I love Jack NBC? Welch. He, he was great to work for. Um, and he loved NBC. It was like his hobby, you know, his thing. And I remember he called me one day and said, you know, what about the morning show talent, Dennis? He said, I think maybe you made a mistake with the last hire. I said, Jack, isn't there something in China you got to worry about? And I said, you, you, you can't be worried about what we're doing here in the morning at WNBC. Um, and, then, and then we went to number one. And so uh, at a dinner, one of the anchors came over a year later and said, Jack Welsh is over genu genuflecting. He says, what's all that about? I said, eh, it's just a long story, um, but don't worry about it. And, 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 and what he, Jack Welsh called me the next day. He says, I want to give uh, stock options to the talent on the morning show. Mm. Um, I said, well, that's great, Jack. But I, he says, is that OK? I said, no, that's great. But I said, it's more than those two people making that show successful. There's a couple of other talent. There's a, a producer, an exec. There's a, d a director. He said, you make a list, I'll give stock options to all of them. And that, that was Jack Welsh. Fantastic. And that's, that's why I loved working for him. Commanded tremendous loyalty and respect. Yeah, Isn't that absolutely. amazing? Now, you know, you've got this wonderful career, tremendous accomplishments we've summarized through conversation. Now let's look forward, where it's a little less clear, a little cloudier, as we look at these turbulent times. As, as you think to the future, Dennis, uh, how do you think local television stations are going to fare uh, as we see this digital revolution that's literally upon us and newspapers gasping for air occasionally, among other things? What, what, what do you see? Well, I think we're confronted with two real immediate challenges. You know, the first one would be economic, would be um, uh, we're, we're um, now into our fifth year when, when the economy, it was actually a, a world collapse. It wasn't just broadcast and it wasn't just the United States. I mean, you know, we, we've been at this now. We're into our fifth year. It, it started in 08. And I must say that the um, 
from what, October? It actually started before that. You, we were starting to take cancellations in April and May of 08, but by the time we got to the fall of 08 and when uh, um, the Wall Street thing really collapsed, um, I'd never seen anything like that in, in all my years in this business. And into 09, it just continued. It, and I wondered if we could ever get it stopped. And um, you know, nobody was going to bail out the, the, the broadcast industry. They were bailing out autos, and they were bailing out finance, but uh, they weren't bailing out broadcast companies. So we had to bail ourselves out. And you can't go down to the basement and print money um, like the government does. Uh, which, what you got to do is, uh, when your revenue does this, guess what? You want to stay in business, you got to do this with your costs. And that's what we did. And we attacked across the board on our cost structure. Um, we, um, we used technology to replace um, headcount. Because you know, so much of our costs are fixed. Our program costs are fixed, our talent costs are fixed, so on. So, um, you know, we put in a graphics hub. We, and when you have, you know, 16 stations doing news, you can save a lot of bodies. We put in a master control hub. We put in a new traffic system. We put in um, studio automation. And the result is, is we, we downsized our workforce by about 25%. Now, that took a lot of hard work, first of all, to put the technology in, and secondly, to negotiate with the unions to get the right to do that. But we did uh, negotiate with the unions, and those were tough, tough, hard negotiations. But we had to get the jurisdiction to be able to, to do that, so we did. Um, we, um, as our talent uh, came up on cycles, uh, we, we reduced our talent costs. And then we went to uh, some of our higher priced talent who had guaranteed contracts, and. Um, uh, traded uh, reduction for uh, longevity mm -hmm. uh, so that we reduced our talent uh, costs by double digits. We reduced our program costs. Um, we, we, you know, we, we, like a, uh, a Seinfeld renewal, we, 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 we were paying uh, way too much money um, and, and uh, we, we let it go as, and, uh, and tried to uh, buy programs uh, more. Um, uh, more cost effective. Um, and so, um, you know, the networks have pooled resources in Washington. You know, the Watergate hearing was a pool. You know, the presidential news conferences are pooled. So they're all covering yes. through one set of cameras, yes. if you will. And so we suggested to some of the other media companies that were struggling, um, that were furloughing people and, so, and going bankrupt, some of them, uh, that we create local news pools that. Um, that instead of having six or seven cameras at a at a news conference that everybody knew about, and you know that we send one camera there, and that we use our cameras in other in in, in our own that uh, create our own exclusive uh, coverage elsewhere, and 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 then helicopters. I mean, um, it, it's just silly to have six seven helicopters flying around getting the same shot. I mean, in in Phoenix they've crashed into one another, and and people have died. And, in Washington since 9-11, you can't fly a helicopter over the city anyway. So um, those, th that was cost savings. And so we, 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 we did what we could to, to get our cost structure down. And if it hadn't been for cost savings, uh, we, we wouldn't have gotten a tourniquet on it. And are you, are you seeing now, this is the first element you're in response was, is the economy. Uh, was there a second item you mentioned, you were going to mention as well, in terms of this response to the, the turbulent yes. times? Yes. Well, the, the other thing is, is that we, we, we had to develop new revenue streams, and so we got into the retrans game. Um, and th thank God for Chase Carey um, coming in uh, you know, to, to basically be the number two person in our company because um, you know, Peter Chernin, who was there prior, that regime uh, did not push for retrans. Uh, you know, Chase had come from DirecTV, and he knew what we were worth. And so, you know, we took on Time Warner and we took on Cablevision, and uh, those were very, very difficult ne negotiations. I mean, we were off the air in the November sweep of 2010 for a couple of weeks in half of New York in a battle with Cablevision, but we got our deals. And, really and, 
that we now have another solid revenue stream. And so those are things that we did. The other thing that we have to address and the other challenge for us in our business is technology. And uh, I, I point to this thing here is this is our competitor. How many people in this audience here um, watch television for news? A few. How many people get their news off of this and their information off of this? Yeah, more hands. More hands than watch television. This is our, you know, I, I keep running around the country to our, our station saying, look, you, you, you shouldn't take an old man with one of these to tell you <laughs> that you better do something. <laughs> I, I said, you, you, you're much younger than me. You should be, uh, you should all know what this is about and be, um, you know, I said, I can sit in a Broadway play and an intermission, get out my cell phone. I don't need to watch your late news when I get home. You better make it compelling. You better make it different. You better give the audience something that, um, um, that they can't get. The other threat technology to us at 10 o'clock, 10 to 11 is the number one time period for DVR viewing. Mm -hmm. So our competition at 10 o'clock is not the other stations doing news at 10 o'clock. We, 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 we beat them easily. Our competition at 10 o'clock is this thing, mobile devices and DVRs. And we have to find a way to make our product more compelling. And um, that's tough to do. I mean, we have a couple thousand people in, 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 uh, in our Fox stations working on news and to try and <laughs> convince them that what they've been doing all these years, they need to change, is tough. Uh, I say, look, you want to be like the textile industry? You, you, you want to be like the, the shoe industry? You want to be like the railroad industry? Um, those were people that never changed how they did their business. Now, Dennis, do you, do you see, uh, it appears that some stations locally uh, around the country are, in fact, putting their own apps uh, on the yes. smartphones yes. as well. I mean, is this a... Uh, kind of a, a, a feeble attempt to address no. the issue, or do you think this is no. part of the solution? No, the, there. You know, we, we we have some apps, but we're not gonna. We're, I don't think we'll get uh, uh, wealthy off our apps. What we need to do is go beyond that. We we we, we need to be in the mobile business, and that's how we want to use our spectrum. Um, the it, you know, in in about 21 gigahertz, it takes maybe 17 or so to do high def, that leaves us a little space in there. We want to use that space for mobile, and we've tested, we tested in Chicago in the tall buildings, and we can do it. We tested in Washington with about 23 different uh, uh, video channels. Uh, the, the, you know, it was, a, it was an industry test, and, and uh, you know, we wanted it in Washington so the FCC and the Congress and people could see it, and the manufacturers worked with us. And, um, you know, local news did very well. And we think that there's a business for us in the mobile. Now, whether it's a subscription business, whether it's ad supported or a combination of both, but there's clearly between the, the mobile devices, the tablets, uh, there's, there's a business there. So your diagnosis is the broadcast te local television is alive, yep. it's getting well, it has lots of challenges, uh, and uh, it's a change or be changed environment. Would yeah, that exactly. Be a reasonable summary? Yes, that is uh, th that's sort of it in a nutshell. But um, y you know, I I'd rather manage in the tougher times than the easier times. How come? Um, it's it's more rewarding. Um, you know, you, you you're comparing wits with the guys across the street, and you know who's going to make it and who isn't. And I I like the challenge. Um, and anything I ever got in life, I worked hard for. And anything I ever got easy, I didn't really have uh, the appreciation for, I think. And so um, I, I don't mind it being difficult. Um, and I, I, I think if we can create the over-the-air screen, the computer screen, and the mobile screen, and tie those three screens together. And now the social media is great, because what social media does is it gives us the ability to be interactive. Mm -hmm. And now we can, we can reach our customer, the viewer. You know, we, we couldn't do that before. Now technology allows us to, 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 to be you know, um, signed up with them on Facebook and, and, so, um, and Twitter. And so um, I, I think 
that um, in the future, there may not be as much as there is today in terms of outlets. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have already seen a number of, of uh, broadcast companies go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, and it, they're, they're, you, you know, technology will allow 500 channels, 600 channels, whatever. As I say, the, the problem is, is human beings only have one set of eyes and there's only 24 hours in a day. So, you know, you know what, what studies show is people only watch maybe as many as 20 channels. They don't watch 500 channels. So uh, somebody won't make it. I mean, when World War II ended, there were hundreds of airlines. And now we're down to, what, about six? So, you know, when I was a kid, there were umpteen kinds of uh, national beers. Now there's three. And so you, you might see some of that change come about in our industry. But the people who um, are uh, nimble, who understand uh, that the technology is changing our business and that we have to change with it and are aggressive about it, um, I think uh, should come out okay. Because people still want information. Sure. And, and we're equipped to cover news all over the United States. And, and, and we held our core together. You know, when, when, when everything collapsed, we, we, we didn't, we didn't you know, we, we put technology to work and downsized some of our workforce, but, you know, we, we didn't lose a major talent. And so, um, we, you know, we're, we're, I think we're okay for the future, right. as long as we don't uh, get complacent and think that we don't have these challenges. Dennis, why don't we stop there with our conversation and open it up to the whole audience. Will you join me in a round of applause for the dialogue that's taken place so far with Dennis? Uh, there are microphones available. Uh, we look forward to hearing your questions of Dennis Swanson. Uh, and while the microphones are coming, just put your hand in the air if you've got a question. While we're waiting for the first question from the audience, I'd like to ask one other question of you, Dennis. You've done so much in the not-for-profit realm. Uh, in addition to your work, uh, uh, working in broadcast television, could you briefly, very briefly, share with us uh, uh, why and how and how this came to be an important part of your life? Well, um this goes back to the, the, how do you make WLS or WNBC or KBC a number one station? And you do it through aggressive news coverage, having the best newscast, but you also do it through community outreach. Television has the ability to unite a lot of people. And, you know, you, you, if you use it correctly, I mean, we, you know, we're licensed by the federal government for, to, to operate on this frequency for the good of the community mm -hmm. and and the outreach is, is satisfying that criteria so if we're doing our job properly to protect our license we are reaching out to the community and using it for good and the and the good that comes to us from it is is rating so it's a win-win okay yes sir so you mentioned with the future that you're sort of concerned about how people have more ways of accessing this information though is there, do you have any sort of concern that they could use all these ways of accessing this information to get to the information more directly and not need so much of a newsman as the middleman? Well, um, somebody's got to, you know, look, we're fascinated with video, and somebody's got to go out and get the video. And, um, you know, we've been doing it and doing it reasonably well for half a century. And um, we have a structure to create video. That's the greatest strength we have locally, we, we, is, is we have the ability to create local video content. And if we are smart about it, I mean, if we, if we give our people the right technology to do their jobs and to continue this video stream, you know, we, we should be okay. Uh, there, the, 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 some of the people that are, uh, have come along and, and been successful uh, in, in this technology area, w w would love to have our video on, on, a, on a daily basis. It's the one thing that we do that, that, that should keep us uh, in, in the game. Am I allowed to follow up to that? Or? Sure, go ahead. Um, so what I'm sort of getting at is, you mentioned the video is the asset. Are you not concerned that sort of users can use it to create their own video and then post that as news? Well, so, some people will. I mean, uh, YouTube. Is, is an example of that. You know, those are three University of Illinois boys that are billionaires, uh, good for them. Um, the, the, uh, the, but the, the reality is, is that we'll always have competition, 
We just have to make sure that we're not afraid of that competition, that we are aggressive in how we continue to run our business, that we don't let the fact that there's an economic downturn destroy our ability to do what we do the best. And, and so, yeah, we'll always be competed against. We've been competed against in one form or another ever since we came along. And now that competition is even more difficult and more rigid. But, um, you know, that's why we go out along with others and spend a lot of money to, 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 to renew the NFL. Other questions? I think there was a hand up here. Uh, microphone here, please, in the front. I'll stand up because he stand up. Um, so a couple of friends of mine are working in local news right now, and one thing they've talked about is the value of who owns their station that really was, I guess, talked about in school. You know, finding a station, not only is it in a good market, but I guess the ownership. Can you comment on... You know, you said earlier with ABC has a different identity to CBS and Fox, so the value, I guess, of finding a station and for local news that has a similar um, ownership and what ownership you would recommend, if any. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, I just use my own experience. And um, it, you, you, you want to work for somebody that you respect, and, and that applies to your ownership question. Um, but I think what's important, particularly at the beginning, I mean, if you're going to go get your first job, my, my first job was in a small market. And you, you, you're, because you're going to make mistakes as you learn. And, um, and so um, you, you, you want to make them um, and get them out of your way, um, <laughs> you know, where fewer people can see them. Um, <laughs> but um, I work, the, the, the owners, of the property that I worked for had national reputations. They were good. I, I knew it was a well-run operation. They were number one, you know, it was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. They were number one in news. They were number one on the radio. Um, the owner there had been the head of the NAB. Um, and, and something else, and, and I don't want anybody to interpret this as uh, uh, an anti-union comment, because I'm not anti-union. I was in AFTRA when I was on the air and I was in NABET when I was a, a, a producer or an assignment manager. Um, but um, in the smaller markets, they tend to be less unionized. And it, when you're young and you're first starting out, you, you want to have as much flexibility and do as many different things as you could. I mean, the one thing that's helped me in my career is I, I, I did so many different things. And, and it was, you know, and when I worked in Cedar Rapids, you know, the sports guy was uh, sick one night. I did the play-by-play -play of a high school football game. The, I could do the weather, um, I, you know, I, and I was sort of a jack of all trades. And, and so that when I got to the bigger markets, um, and then when I got into management, I, I, was, hard to, I was hard to fool. Um, you know, I, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, when the cameraman tells you he's stuck in traffic, that means he's at McDonald's. Okay. <laughs> So, um, but you're right, you want to pick a good operation and, and you want, you know, who owns it, you know, you know are they committed to news, if, that, if that's what you're pursuing, and, 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 it, and you're wise to do some homework in that regard. But I would look at the smaller markets or look at the cable uh, news operations. We hire a lot of people out of the cable 12s and uh, news one in New York because the, the, they get good training there. And, and so, um, th that's, a, that's another good uh, source. Other questions in the back? Hi, I have a question more from like a programming standpoint. Um, I know I've been reading a lot recently in the last year or two about NBC and some of the struggles they've had and how they've kind of, I guess they're kind of making their way up the chart still at the bottom of the big four. Um, I know you work for Fox, but I was wondering what kind of alternatives maybe you thought, think that they could look into to kind of advance themselves. And also playing off of that, you know, when a lot of people have talked about The Voice and this show that they have that's kind of giving them some success, when are we going to see an end to these singing shows? Because I feel like they're all going to knock each other out eventually. <laughs> well, uh, w you know, broadcasting is a copycat business. You knew that when the, because of the success of American Idol, 
you know, somebody else was going to do the voice or whatever you wanted to call it. Um, and, and so um, it doesn't surprise me to see invitations uh, come along. Um, and, and that's part of, um, you know, Los Angeles and in the media business. You know, somebody gets a hit in a certain genre and you see the copycat versions come along. It is very, very difficult for a network when they're down to uh, resurrect themselves because their, their, their promotion in prime time, when you're last, you, your promos carry less weight than, they, than, than, than your competitors do. So um, it, it's hard to reestablish yourself once you get into that position. I mean, that's why when CBS lost the, the, the NFL, you know, they, the, their prime time numbers went down. And they, and they came back when they got the NFL back because it's a great promotion platform um, to, to, to reach people. And so, um, and that's what makes American Idol, even though its ratings are a little bit lower, it still wins its time periods. And, and Fox is number one in prime in, uh, in 18 to 49 and 25 to 54 viewers. And that means our promos get seen by way more than our competitors do. So, you know, those are the kind of advantages that you look for. In terms of what NBC can do to get themselves back in, well, um, you know, the voice is working for them. Um, I don't know that Smash is working for them. Um, it's, it loses an awful lot of its lead in, then it loses every quarter hour, and they poured a lot of money into it. But, you know, um, but, it, but they now have at least a vehicle that, that, that they can spin programs off of, and, you know, that, and, and, and that's a start for them. They haven't had that in the past. So, um, uh, they, they, um, but they've got a, a, a tough row ahead of them uh, because, you know, to come up with uh, you know, 22 hours of prime, which they have to do, we only have to come up with 15 because we run less prime than our competitors. So that makes it a little bit easier on our entertainment division than, than uh, those people have on theirs. And CBS is a formidable, uh, you know, Les Moonves is very talented when it comes to picking uh, network uh, programs. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, what um, is it on? Yes. Oh, okay. What special considerations might you have had to make um, after 9/11? 9/11 um, was um, was uh, such an experience. Um, you know, I've had a couple of those in my life. Um, you know, I was on the desk in, New, in uh, Chicago when uh, uh, Dr. King was assassinated. And in those days, you know, we didn't have electronic cameras and all that. We had film crews, and they were our crews that were out of Chicago that were down in Memphis covering Dr. King. And, you know, I was on the desk that night. I could look out my window in the Merchandise Mart and watch the west side of Chicago go up in flames. 35, 36, 37 people were killed that night on streets in Chicago. Um, when the convention assignments came down for the Democratic National Convention in 1968 in Chicago, you know, I'd just come to NBC News in uh, uh, like uh, February of that year. So I'm assigned to all coverage outside the amphitheater. I was, I was irate. I went down to the uh, news director's office. I said, what kind of nonsense is this? I said, uh, you know, I want to be at the convention. He said, Dennis, just, you know, you know more about Chicago than anybody, just, just do your job. Um, and I said, well, this is politics, I don't like this. Uh, but then it turned out to be the story. 9-11, uh, um, my wife and I had just come back from Portugal the night before. And, um, and I came back because Tuesday was uh, election day in New York City for the mayor's race, the primary. And so, uh, because I'd been on vacation for two weeks, you know, my, my, the first thing I did was uh, uh, schedule an 8.30 appointment to get a haircut. So I'm about 10 minutes into the haircut when the phone rings and uh, the barber says it's for you. And it was my news director at Channel 4. And she says, Dennis, an airplane just flew into the World Trade Center. I said, it's terrorism. Uh, it, was, it was my first guy, I said, it's terrorism, I'm on the way. 
and I ripped the cloth off and I ran um, to, uh, it wasn't that far, it was about six blocks. Um, I, I, I ran to, my, uh, to the news department in uh, uh, Rockefeller Center and uh, uh, we had an employee in the building. Um, he was on the 110th floor, he died. Um, we talked to him, I didn't, but our master control talked to him, told him to power down, get out of the building, but when you're on the 110th, all the broadcast people that were there, evacu they're, they're ordered to evacuate to the roof. And if you look carefully, you see people on the roof. Uh, those are some of the people that went off the building, you know, when it, when it collapsed. Um, but um, we, you know, the, now we lost our antenna. And, you know, somebody called me to say, yo, well, you people are very stupid. You had your antenna and your backup antenna on the World Trade Center. That's, that's very stupid. I said, well, yeah, I guess so. I guess nobody ever figured the World Trade Center would come down. Um, but we got a, a, an auxiliary antenna up in New Jersey quickly, and the industry worked together. We all pooled together. And um, we, we stayed on the air, what, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We stayed on the air for virtually a week round the clock doing coverage. And um, I was always proud of the role that television played because whether they were, because television held New York together. That's what saved, I think, uh, from all the panic uh, is, you know, people came to television. You know, they didn't go on their cell phone or they didn't go to, computer screens, you know, when there's something like that, they come, they come to television. And, um, cause, and, and so, you know, whether they're politicians, whether they're psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, general public, uh, conservatives, liberals, Republicans, Democrats, you know, most everybody would acknowledge that it was television that helped New York come back to itself. And, um, and, and gain the confidence because uh, people were scared to death. And so uh, I was always proud of the role that uh, the media, that the television industry, because we cooperated with one another. It, you, you, it, when things like that happen, you, you don't worry about whether you're first, second, third, or fourth. You don't worry about whether you're, you, know, you want your competitor to be on the same tower that you are. And we got there and, and worked together to, to get that accomplished. And so. Um, it, was, it was quite an experience. Um, and um, it, what was interesting was the second, you know, the World Trade Center was considered the number one target in, in New York. The number two target was considered to be Rockefeller Center. And so the police ordered Rockefeller Center evacuated. So I had the entire television station gather in the newsroom and I said, look, I said, if there's anybody that's scared, if there's anybody that uh, wants to go home, um, then um, you're free to do so. And by the way, they've ordered evacuation of the building. And, but I said, we have to stay on the air. And so um, the, the only way we can do that is somebody will have to stay here. And some kid, uh, I think it was an intern, um, I didn't recognize him. He said to me, he said, what are you going to do? I just said, you don't know me, young man. I said, I was a Marine in the 60s. <laughs> he said, well, I guess we're staying. <laughs> and, um, you know, nobody left. Not one employee left. And, um, I, 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 and um, Channel 4, Channel 7, Channel 2, Channel 11, Channel 9 all did a great job. And, um, and what's the, what benefit do we get from that? When, in this, when we fight for our spectrum now, which we're fighting for in Washington, we can point to 9-11, and then we can point to Irene coming through Washington, D.C., and the blizzard that came through Washington, D.C., and say to the commissioners and to the Congress people, you know, wh wh where did you get your information? Over the air television. Other questions? In the very back, there are two questioners back there. Take your pick. Um, I have a question.
question about television ratings and the Nielsen system. Sure. So with almost with especially in the younger demographic with people watching the majority of their stuff online, maybe even all of their programming online, and with Nielsen ratings being so inaccurate as everyone knows, do you see a shift in how advertisers will base their their uh, decisions on and like, what do you think needs to happen for the shift in ratings and advertisers? Well, you've touched on a fascinating subject. I mean, we could come back here tomorrow and spend another couple of hours talking about it. Um, uh, the, the, it actually began here in Boston, um, right in the, you know, like 2002, 2003. And that's when Nielsen put in people meters that gave demographics. And the industry was petrified because when they'd put in just the people meters still with diaries back in the late 80s, the ratings did this. And so the industry decided, and, and who owned television stations in Boston? CBS did, Fox did, Sunbeam did, um, the Tribune did, and Hearst did. And nobody would buy the new service from Nielsen. And so, they couldn't roll it out elsewhere until they figured out Boston. And then somebody got caught cheating. Somebody got caught using the demographics. I can tell you it wasn't CBS because that's where I was at the time. And I can tell you that it wasn't Fox because that's where I am now. But somebody got caught cheating. And, and now Nielsen had leverage. And so they signed up then for the ratings and the demographics. So the rest had no choice but to do the same. Well, that system um, is so intensive that um, it's hard for me to believe there's a, there's a high faulting rate with it, particularly in the morning. You know, people aren't going to sit there and input, you know, there's four people in the room and they're demo, they're going to input all that stuff when they're getting ready to go to work or go to school. So there are inaccuracies. To answer your question, um, it, there are competitors now that are coming along, Rentrax has come along. And the agencies are starting to um, think seriously about alternatives. And so a lot of the smaller market stations, rather than pay Nielsen some exorbitant rate, look, the industry let Nielsen become a monopoly. There was Arbitron, there was Nielsen. The industry, you know, in order to save costs, let Arbitron go and got what they deserved. We got what we deserved. We got a, a monopoly. We, we got Nielsen. And, um, and we've regretted it ever since. But now, alternatives, you know, TiVo probably in some markets could give you uh, ratings information. The problem is, is they don't have, and the, with Rentrax, is they, they don't have demographics. And we sell demographics. We, we never sell a household number. And, and, and they, don't, uh, they only are on the primary set. You know, and we get a lot of viewing in the bedroom and in the kitchen. So um, it's not perfect, but it's a huge concern. And, um, and there is unrest in the industry because of it. And um, you know, I, I meet with Nielsen all the time, and it's a frustration because we know that there are a lot of inaccuracies in the numbers. And that's what we live off of. So, uh, you know, we, we, we talk to the, the rising group of competitors, but they still need to figure out a few things that they haven't done yet. Uh, some time ago, there was a push by Congress um, for the, I, I don't know exactly what the name of it was, but it was something to the FCC Fair Broadcasting Initiative or Act. And I'm curious to find out, um, how does that influence your network? How does politics influence the stories that you guys put out um, for the public to read or listen to or watch or, you know, what have you? Well, I want to answer your question, but I, I, it, it's hard for me because I, I, you know, you, you, I, I'm not sure what, what, what you, you, one year, the Congress and the FCC, I'm not sure which there initiative was, you're talking about. Again, I don't recall the, the name specifically, but it, there was some initiative that was pushed by Congress onto the networks, onto the, the, the newspapers, uh, all the different networks, to be able to fairly um, address certain or 
more or less stories. So it wasn't just, you know, like Fox is considered very conservative. Uh, CNN would be more liberal center. Their, their, you know, their, their effort was to kind of balance it out and in, in a sense impose on the networks um, a fairness of the stories that are, that are presented to the public. Well, we fought a number of big wars in this country and one of the things we fought for is uh, freedom of the press and the First Amendment. And in fact, the only freedom that's guaranteed constitutionally is, is the First Amendment and is freedom of the press. And so uh, Congress or the FCC or anybody else isn't gonna be able to legislate what people cover or don't cover. Um, it, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure specifically what initiative you're talking about. There has been some um, discussions, but um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're protected constitutionally um, by uh, First Amendment right. Look, you know, I, 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 I'll give you an example. In 1991, the Pan Am Games were in Havana, Cuba, and the United States government tried to stop ABC Sports from going to Havana, Cuba to cover it because of the boycott that we have against right. uh, the Cubans. And ABC Sports sued the United States government. And um, you, you knew we were going to win. They, they can't stop us from going to Havana, Cuba to cover the Pan Am Games. It's a national or international event. And the court threw out the the, the, the U.S. government's argument, then off to Cuba we went. And so, um, you know, we, we're, um, we have to use it responsibly. We have to use our right responsibly. But um, they, they're not going to be able to tell you what you can cover and what you can't cover, not, 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 not the, the way our law and our Constitution is structured. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Are there questions? We have a whole bunch of hands. Start with, is that you, Steph? That, that being said, um, do you ever get anxious or nervous or um, have stress about when, you, when you're working with a station that broadcasts something against what your beliefs are? Because you have worked on both sides of the spectrum and different networks. I was just wondering if that affected you. No, you know, I, I've worked uh, um, for um, NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox, and uh, there was one... Uh, rule that always governed um, my thinking in news, which is, um, uh, you know, I called it fab. You know, we want to be fair, accurate, and balanced. And, uh, you know, if we want to present uh, uh, both sides or all sides to stories, and as long as we satisfy that requirement. And, and, and sure, there's, we're, we're going to interview or put uh, people, uh, subject matter on, that I may personally uh, disagree with, but that's not my role. Is to, uh, my, my, you know, my, my role is to make sure that we have as wide uh, 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 an expression of ideas as possible. I think that's, um, that, that's our obligation, which is why I always, uh, you know, when the, when the FCC um, uh, was turned back by the courts in Washington um, a few years back on, uh, on its uh, EEOC uh, efforts, I, I actually submitted a paper. I went to NBC and asked if I could do it, and they said yes. I actually submitted a paper in favor of the FCC um, because um, I, I thought that uh, diversity in, in our newsrooms was absolutely imperative because it would ensure that we would have multiple voices uh, in, in our product, and uh, uh, I, I, I have strong feelings about that. And so, but but yeah, once in a while, you know, when 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 you put a, a, a variety of voices on, you're <laughs> you're going to get some that you may personally uh, find uh, uh, difficult to accept. But you know, that's uh, that, that, that we, we can't think that way. We, we what we have to remember is that we're operating on a public airwave, and we have a responsibility. <coughs> To, uh, to keep that in mind. Final question. Pick whoever you'd like to pick. Here, here's vote. right down here. We have more questions in time. 
Hi, uh, you mentioned um, what the recession did to TV and how the rate, how all the revenue went down. Uh, it might be a simplistic way of looking at it, but I always thought that the only benefit from unemployment might be TV ratings. Uh, can you maybe talk about that? Just how people are home, I guess, more? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the, um, um, uh, the, the unemployment is, um, um, should make, I guess, uh, people available for uh, uh, daytime viewership. I, I don't, um, you know, it, uh, I, I, I don't know any particular statistics on that. Um, I, I just know that a downturn in the economy is not a healthy situation. What we need in the United States is people working, period. You can't have high unemployment and have a happy society. You know, people need to have their dignity and their self-worth. And when people are on the dole, they lose their dignity and their self-worth. And um, the quicker that our, we get our economy turned around and get people back to work and feeling productive, uh, and, and if that means that they'd watch less television, that's a great trade-off, okay? Dennis, thank you so very much. <laughs> Dennis, I, I have uh, one more question that, that might be on the minds of, of a number of our students in the audience uh, that I'll ask on their behalf, and that is uh, maybe a word of advice from you for those students who might be contemplating pursuing a career in broadcasting. What would your advice be? What's it take? Uh, is it a good industry to try to enter? And also, what would your advice be for those students who might make that choice? Well, um, I don't want any of my comments to, 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 to scare anybody about the future of the media or broadcasting. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a great industry. It's still a great industry to be in. It, th they're fun jobs. Uh, I, I've I've done it since, I don't know, what, 53, 54 years now. Um, and I love it as much today as I did when I started. Uh, this is going to be a great year. Politics is just unbelievable <laughs> this year. You know, what, what could be better than a brokered convention? Man, that's a hit. You know, um, you know, you know who knows? So, and so um, it, it's still a wonderful business. And if we're uh, smart and we don't sit around and let ourselves become dinosaurs, we'll be around for a while. Um, in terms of how to get started, I, I touched on it a little bit uh, earlier, but I think you start, um, it, you know, the first job is the toughest job. And, and you can't get discouraged. You gotta bang on a lot of doors, talk to a lot of people. Hopefully you have an angel um, or somebody looking out for you, but not everybody does or has that connection. But you can't get discouraged. The one thing that you have when you're young is you tend to have mobility. And if you have mobility and you got a brain and a, and a degree from a great university, which this is, um, ultimately um, you, you ought to be able to find work. Then once you get that job, and by the way, I've had a number of uh, Boston University students as employees over the years, and um, I can't think of one that didn't perform at a high level. Intelligent people and always made a great contribution to our success, which is you know, one of the reasons I was glad to uh, come and, uh, and, and speak to, uh, to you all today. Um, but once you get a job, um, then don't, don't become complacent. Don't take it for granted. Um, I, I don't take my job today for granted. I still work hard. Um, and um, I, you know, you know I, I tell, I tell my son the same thing. You, you got to work hard in life to be a success. The, the competition is so fierce. I mean, look, look at yourself now. You know, when, when, when you were in grade school, everybody was there, and the dumb kids and the bright kids, and you're all together, and you went to high school, is the same thing. And then you got to college, and all of a sudden, you know, it narrowed down, and it winnowed down. And then if you went on in college to get another degree, it really got narrow. And so that pyramid keeps closing on you. And, and then you go out into the business world, and particularly in a down economy, there aren't uh, that many jobs. So the people that have the most to offer, the people that, that are not concerned about um, uh, you know, the perks and all that stuff, but who want to just come and work hard, 
um, and, and get themselves established. If you can get in a foot in the door and get that first job, then your, your, your work is your resume. I mean, that's what I tell our employees today. I said, look, even if you don't like working for us, you want to go someplace else. You know, I understand. I've done the same thing, you know. I got a boss that I didn't like, so I left. And, um, but my work was my resume. I had a good reputation. And it's, a, it's actually a fairly small business compared to some other businesses. So, um, but, you know, my advice is, is to give yourself a broadest easel to paint on as you can. You know, don't, I only want to be a cameraman, you know, or I only want to be an editor. Um, maybe that's what you'll turn out to be, but maybe your first job isn't as specific as that. But get into a news operation someplace. Try to answer Matt's question over here. Try and pick a good one, good ownership, uh, good reputation, and then once you get there, do your darndest to make sure you're a valuable employee and, and that, you know, I always compare it to a baseball team. They go to spring training, they take 40 people plus some extras. But when they come north, they only have 25. There are eight position players that are regulars. There are 12 pitchers. So they're only picking five other people to come. That's how tough it is to make a major league baseball team. Um, but who, so who gets those five positions? People that can switch hit, people that can pinch run, people that are, can play four or five positions that have made themselves indispensable in some fashion or another. And that's what you want to do. And so um, I, I would just uh, keep some of that in mind and, and, and don't get discouraged. And the other thing, and I, I use the expression with uh, 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 people is, people say, well, how'd you get to where, you know what? I always wanted to be in television, uh, you know, I followed my dream. So you know? pursue your dream, have passion, work very hard, and be willing to take some risks along the way, Boy, just as you did. And, and usually, something good will happen. Yeah, yeah something good will happen. And, and as you go through life, you're going to have ups and downs, folks. Trust me. <laughs> and, and the quality of your life will not be determined by the ups. Your quality of your life will be determined by the downs and how you deal with them. And life is not always going to be easy. And how you uh, deal, and how you deal with, with, with your first job. God, I never thought I was going to get a job. <laughs> you know, and I, could, I didn't understand it. I was frustrated. I, I thought, you know, I had a wife and kid. And I, I wasn't as mobile as some. I, you know, I, didn't, I, I didn't want to go to Roanoke, Virginia. You know, and so, um, um, but finally, my professor got me my job because I'd worked for him at Illinois. I was his assistant. And he called his old station and said, she's hired this guy because he's good. And, and they, they listened to him. And so I, I didn't ask you know, what the salary was or, or, or I didn't ask about vacation or anything. When, when I found out it was 120 bucks a week, I was a little dismayed. But, uh. <laughs> well, the final word of wisdom, make sure you keep in close contact with your faculty members. <laughs> they will help you with the first job. Okay, thanks again. You know thank what? You so much. Um, <laughs> And also, thank you to all of you for yeah, joining thank, us. Yeah, you know what? Uh, and also for the co-sponsors today, the College I, of Communications School of Management and the I, College of I Technology. said to Ken, I'm amazed anybody showed up. I said, when I was a kid in <laughs> Illinois, and you'd have told me I had to go listen to some old guy at 5 o'clock, I wouldn't have been there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks again. Dennis. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you.